Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our webinars. Uh, we have the wonderful Hamish, uh, Hamish Clark from St. Clair with us today. Wine, head winemaker, chief winemaker. I saw a yeah. few different titles hey. around. Yeah, yeah, a winemaker. A winemaker, the main one. Uh, yeah, so we're lucky to have Hamish with us today. I'm a big fan of St. Clair uh, wines. Um, got introduced to them, I think, in 2016, and the Warra Reserve was the first one I tried, and it blew me away. And I mean, it's a little, little pricier than some of the ones we're showing today. Um, but yeah, and it's it's made me stick with the brand ever since. Uh, so yeah, I'm really happy that you joined us. And of course, we've got Amelia again. Hi, Amelia. Thank you so much. Hi, guys. Awesome to be here. Um, and I'll just go through um, a few things. I think that everyone who's joined, I haven't double checked the attendees, but I think everyone who's joined has been here before. So I think you all know the score, but just to go through in case there's anyone else uh, that hasn't. Um, the, uh, the webinar uh, is shown on screen, as you can see. Um, there's a speaker view and there's also a gallery view. Um, so the speaker only shows who's talking, the gallery view shows all three of us, because there's only three of us. I generally just have it on gallery view, but totally up to you. Um, there is a chat box, uh, which we monitor as we go through, we read it and uh, interact with you guys in your comments. And then there's also a Q&A box, which is separate. Uh, the chat box can roll, like scroll through quite quickly, so you don't always catch everything. So if you have specific questions that you want to ask Hamish, um, then do put them in the Q&A box and I'll make sure that those questions are definitely answered before the end. Um, and then uh, anything else? No, I think that's it. And then the other thing I wanted to just um, mention today, I've had three people um, this week ask me about Coravan because I've, bit, I've mentioned that we've got um, a Coravan um, discount code. Um, and I had- That is worth it guys. <laughs> Get what, what discounts you can with that stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, and I had um, three people this week not ask me, should I get it? What do you do? How do you use it? But they'd gone to the website and then they uh, weren't sure which model to use. So this afternoon I just did a quick video um, explaining those. So if you're, if you get to that point of, you know, which one, which one should I be buying? Um, it's on my website, Princess Napino. Dot com and it's also on my YouTube channel and all of our videos that we've um, done with uh, Amelia are on the YouTube channel as well all the webinars so if you're still interested in catching up on any of those past sessions um, you can you can just search for Princess wow, the okay so um, yeah we are going to be going through three wines today um, we have the Block three Sauvignon Blanc. Um, we have the Hawke's Bay Viognier Origins and we have the Pinot Noir Origins as well. And we'll be going through those. Oh and will be telling us um, little, you know, the tasting notes for the wines, but also uh, we'll be, like, I've got a few questions that I want to ask about how and what the labels mean and, and, and what like. So again, if you guys have got any questions, do so I'm really looking forward to it. We've had another question again. What's on Hamish's t-shirt? What's the vintage uh, t-shirt? <laughs> yep, this, is, this is our vintage t-shirt for 2020. <laughs> it's too good. Yeah. Too good. Yeah. yeah. Really, really fun. Is it quite, I mean, Hamish, tell us a little bit about what it's like working at St. Clair, because it's family oriented isn't it it's really that's right yeah yeah it's it's very much a family family owned run business um neil the owner is neil Ibbotson, the owner is still very much hands on um we see him pretty much every day out at the winery uh, yeah no it's, it's a great place to work certainly um when i started back in the year 2001 with saint Clair, um it's it's i've seen it go through some amazing transformations but really the um the the whole sort of um, ethos of St. Clair hasn't changed from day dot. It's just a, a bigger company now than, than what it was. And 
And that was back in the 70s, wasn't it, when it was a Yeah, so Neil, Neil and Judy planted grapes in 78. Um, putting that in context, Brincott or Montana, as it was back in those days, now in Bopernerica, they, they set up their first vineyards here in Marlborough, first commercial plantings back in um, late 73. So, yeah, Neil and Judy are really pioneers of uh, yeah. the grape growing industry, or, or part of the pioneers here anyway. And weren't they, weren't they pig farmers? Or something like that. <laughs> a little bit, Neil likes to tell that story. Um, he he he's pretty humble, uh, but no, Neil Neil was a farm advisor. Um, that was that was kind of he studied it at an agricultural college, Lincoln University down in Canterbury, um, and was farm advising for a, for a number of years before they started dabbling with grapes. Um, and then 1994, they decided that they that had a crack and do their own label called Saint Clair. Um, I guess a tribute to an early pioneer here in Marlborough back in the back in the early settle, settling days, I guess, a guy called James Sinclair. Um, and some of you may have seen James Sinclair as a label, um, one of our sort of sub brands, I guess, to a degree. I think so that's a, it's a tribute. Saint Sainsbury's that one. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. So that's a tribute to. That's where the name Saint Clair comes from. It's um, really James Sinclair. No, no. And you're. Like your background is in biology, zoology? Yeah, so I studied microbiology and zoology at university um, with a view at that stage to go on to work in the marine um, industry, sort of aquaculture or that sort of thing. Um, that's a postgrad diploma. So I studied microbiology and finished a zoology degree as well as sort of a, a BSc with the view to go on to do the postgrad, but um, the travel back took cold and zoomed off to Australia and then on to the UK. Took my first sort of real professional job utilising my degree skills, I guess, um, working in forensics in Huntingdon. Yeah, so yeah, a bit of a change, bit of a change from what I'm doing now. Yeah, and that was part of a recruitment drive um, uh, yeah. back in the late 90s. Um, UK, well, the, the government there um, passed the criminal justice bill, which means that everyone that was arrested had to submit a, a cheek cell scraping. Um, for DNA for DNA analysis, and um, when I got to the UK, um, yeah, working in, in a little place called um, the Telegraph Hotel up in Putney Heath. Yeah. So that was that was that was sort of home base there for a while. The Ibbotson family, Serena, Julie, Tony, were living down in Wimbledon. Um, so having gone to school with all these guys, it was good to have some friends close by. Um, but yeah, they, yeah. So I applied for a job in, in in the forensics and that recruitment drive. Got taken on board and shifted up to Huntington. So a little bit different to what I'm doing now. But, I have yeah. to ask, just because like, I love crime thrillers and psychological yeah. <laughs> and detective stuff. Do you think there's actually like a reason why, like doing something like that, did you kind of lose your will and humanity? And it's like, actually, I just want to like go back to nature. Because wow. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can imagine it must be like quite pretty intense, especially when you're up in Huntington. Yeah, well, um, to, to be honest, our part of it wasn't super exciting. Um, the technology was amazing. Um, it was very, very cutting edge doing DNA profiling. Um, but for it's us, it was all just like it. It was all just um, it was all just barcodes for us. Um, it was very in terms of in terms of the forensic integrity. Um, there was no details disclosed. It was just barcodes and, and numbers. We did, however, get get a, a monthly report as to what uh, crimes would help to solve and it was pretty amazing some of them some of them um, dated back sort of five six seven years ago there'd be a burglary up in up in Scotland and then there'd be another another crime committed somewhere else and a cigarette butt found DNA extracted off that so we're solving some some pretty amazing crimes that have been cold cases almost but the other part of the forensic um, lab was it was all pretty exciting the Huntingdon lab um, process just about anything and everything including seizures from Dover um, there was a big drugs lab there um, pretty incredible some of the stuff that they were catching and that was only what they were catching but everything big class pains so you could see into each laboratory serious crime was um, crimes to body and there was some pretty gory stuff that those guys were having to go through the one department I would have hated to work in was um, documents and these guys I don't know how they how they did it every day but um they would have bags of shredded documents and they would have to piece them together like a jigsaw and no. so they'll be trawling through these trash bags 
of documents, trying to put them together. Um, I couldn't do that. I can't even do jigsaws. You need a lot of patience for that, I think. <laughs> you would. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it was like, it was a really proud job to have. Um, they wanted to take me on permanently there, but um, the paperwork went down to Home Office in London and they came back with a reply that, um, sorry, we can't employ a foreign national. Um, basically, if I'd been a professor and could have offered them something other than um, uh, just the stuff that I'd learned and trained, they probably would have taken me on. But in some respects, um, like I, I was really disappointed that I couldn't stay on there permanently. But in a lot of respects, um, I'm glad that I got moved on, so to speak. They wanted to take me, they, they wanted to take me on um, just as a contract, yeah. uh, in a contracting role. But um, I went there to travel, I went there to see Europe, I went to see my home roots back in Scotland and you know, just that it wasn't happening. I just wasn't earning enough and certainly wasn't getting enough time off to go and do that. Yeah. So I've just got um, one, of our, one of our growers um, has just turned up. It's, um, it's the duck season has just opened here. So um, I've got a very kind grower that's just dropped off some fresh wild duck. Wow. Um, yeah. So pretty lucky. Is that, so that going to go with your Pinot Noir later? It could well do, yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. So no, so so from from there, I went back down to London. Um, just a quick nutshell as to how how things transpired here. Went back down to London, worked at King's College Hospital in in cytology lab there. The lab manager is awesome. Um, I was getting paid three times what I was getting paid as a as a temp, um, and that really gave me the funds to go and start doing a little bit of travel. Um, the lab manager would allow me to go in and do some trips overseas, uh, well, call it over to Europe. Um, so I got to see a little bit of Europe, not as much as I would have liked, um, but she just held my job open. Rather than employing someone else, she would just held my job open, come back two weeks later and all the urgent stuff would have been processed through. But um, yeah, we seem to get on, to it, uh, on with it, the Kiwis. Work hard, play hard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so eventually, eventually my uh, holiday visa ran out, went onto a tourist visa, did some more travel, ended up back right at the very start of 2001. And while I was waiting for all my gear to come back from the UK, took a job working at a place called Marlborough Valley Cellars, um, just as a lab, um, lab manager. And while I'd been, I'd had a dabble in the wine industry before I went to university. Um, I really enjoyed the work, did a couple of vintages with Sally Lebrun, a method producer. Back in those days, I just found the, there was a, a, an air of pretentiousness and as a young 20 something kid that didn't really know what he wanted to do, um, it didn't grab me the way it sort of grabbed me when I got back in 2001. And having, having understanding certainly on the microbiology side of things, having the understanding of, of fermentation and what's happening there. But really it was the hands-on, get dirty. Um, that, was, that was really what, what got me. I also had um, the benefit of, of understanding what job satisfaction meant, having worked in a couple of other professions as well. Um, forensics was a really cool job to have. The perks in the wine industry are slightly better than working in forensics, I've got to say. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you don't want any freebies um, in forensics. No, no. So, so, so basically in a nutshell, that's, that's how I got, um, not back into, into wine making, but also there was an electricity. I grew up here in Marlborough and it's a small retiring town, um, very much a, just a rural centre, rural service centre for all the farmers around the place. But there was an electricity here that um, I hadn't experienced growing up here. Um, I never actually thought I'd come back to live in Blenheim. Um, we enjoy high sunshine hours, but that also attracts a lot of retirees that, um, that want to come up and, and don't want to leave New Zealand or don't want to leave the South Island, but um, it had a very retiring population. Not too many young kids were hanging around. Most, most people were opting to go overseas or go and work in big cities. Um, but great to see that um, these days as there's a local guys my age type thing that are all coming back because of the opportunities, especially that the wine industry is opening up. Yeah. What so are those are there aside from wine in that part of the world? Sorry, what's that? What, what other, oh, sorry, we should go to the first wine, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, please. <laughs> well, yeah. I think, I think main topic of conversation with this wine being um, a Sauvignon Blanc is kind of yep. you know, 
opportunities must have just taken yeah. when that exploded um because That's it right. has yeah. exploded over here yeah. so if you want to because I'm sure some people, are, if they haven't tasted already, which I think probably most of oh, them have, but I do know yeah. some people wait until uh, the tasting notes come through. Let's keep going. So if you can yeah. do the tasting notes for the Sauvignon Blanc Block 3, and yeah. then we'll talk a little bit about the success of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. Sure, yeah, no problem at all. Okay, so the Pioneer Block series, um, very much a part of um, St. Clair's uh, success, I guess. Um, the discovery of, of Sauvignon for Marlborough has been um, exceptional. Uh, we don't we don't often see a single variety put onto the centre stage like Sauvignon has done for Marlborough. Um, so the Block Three part of our Pioneer Block series. Um, back in the early two thousands, when things were really just taking off, Neil very much had the um, understanding of the only way we can learn quickly is by keeping all of our single vineyard stuff separate. So all of our vineyards to this day continue to be harvested and fermented separately. We go through a blind grading to um, work out quality tiers. Yeah. And back in those early 2000s, we had discovered this area called Dillon's Point. Um, things were just newly, reasonably newly planted down there. Um, our very first wine from that area was made in the year 2000. Um, by the time we got to 2004, a number of different plantings were happening down there. St. Clair, we kept that area pretty secret. That was, that was um, our little secret. It's really what catapulted St. Clair into, into the limelight, um, the discovery of that area. And by the time we got through to 2004, we were starting to see all these nuances in the single vineyards that we were um, harvesting and fermenting through. Um, they were all um, incredible in quality. And we thought, how can we showcase this? Um, how can we understand more about this? And so we developed the Pioneer Block Series. Back, back in those days, it was very small, a couple of hundred cases of each single vineyard. Um, but Pioneer Block number three has been a single vineyard expression right from, right from 2004. Hasn't missed a beat. Um, it's, I, guess, it's, I guess a lot of um, wineries will like, black, like just pick the grapes and make some wine and then ship that out, whereas that's, you keep each individual plot separate. That's right. I understand yeah. it. And then you taste them, grade them, and then yep. blend them if you need to, but some of them might just be on their own straight up. Exactly. And, and there's always surprises every year. Um, there's, there's blocks that may not taste that tasty on the, on the, on the grapevine, but through ferment and, and they come through exceptional. Had we, had we relied on historic knowledge, I guess, and pre-blended or field blended, put them in a big tank to ferment them through, you lose that ability to understand what's happening in the vineyard. So that's been a big part of St. Clair's success. Um, very early in the piece, we're able to hotspot where we considered the best places to grow, not only Sauvignon, but the other varieties or varietals as well. Um, and so we, we have a very firm understanding now of, uh, of what we consider the best areas for these particular varieties. And so the Stillens Point area, I'll, I might quick, quickly just flip to the map and then we'll get onto the tasting notes. Um, so to give everybody a bit of, bit of an overview, New Zealand, of course, Marlborough at the top, Cloudy Bay, obviously Cloudy Bay have, have used that as their inspiration for their, for their label. But this, this little area here, I don't know whether you can see that little hand cursor. Mm -hmm. Can you guys see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this area to the east of the Blenheim Township here, um, nobody had planted in here at, at that stage. Everybody was focusing on this area called the Golden Mile up in Rapara. Um, and, you know, this area down here, incredibly fertile. And as you can see, fully planted out with vineyards now. But back in the early 2000s, um, totally undiscovered. And so this is, this is really Saint, where St. Clair focuses all of our on that top tier, top of our portfolio comes from this area. Um, so Pioneer Block number three, um, which is the wine that we're tasting. I'll quickly just... Um, this, this will give you guys a little bit of an insight as to the volume of not only contract growers, but also estate-grown fruit. And it's a pretty extensive list. Oh, as you can see. So you buy so a million of, from other people who are growing it and you keep their grapes. Everything is 
separate. everything is kept separate. Yeah. And you everything might not buy separate. it if it's not right for you. Is that how it works? No, we we have we have um, long well, not long term contracts, but long existing relationships with all of our growers. We very very rarely lose a grower or um, or move them on. But this particular one that you're tasting at the moment is is from a guy called Marco Sullivan. Um, He's got three separate blocks, but the one we're tasting is from his north block. So we'll just quickly zoom in on that. Um, orientation, we're looking north-south, east-west, sorry, east-west. And the inspiration for this particular block, Pioneer Block 3, 43 degrees, is the orientation of the vineyard here. And um, you can see it sort of stretches out. We actually mapped it, um, and it's about 43 degrees off north-south which is the inspiration for the name, Pioneer Block 3, 43 degrees. Most of the planting here in Marlborough is sort of more on a north-south aspect. So you're getting nice, um, you're getting a nice amount of, what, nice evenness of ripening both sides of the canopy. So 43 degrees, not really, it, it, in those early days, it wouldn't have been our preference to have strung the vineyard rows out on this aspect. But what we discovered after um, a few years is that You've got the north side of the vine experiencing um, probably two thirds of um, good exposure on, on, on the fruit. On the south side, it only really sees the morning sunshine. And what that's doing is building a, 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 a green thread into the, into the back of the palate. So you've got these beautiful mm -hmm. tropical aspects, um, passion fruit, black currant, that sort of thing coming in. But um, with, a, with a green thread woven into the back, of, of the wine and I think that's that's been a big part of, of the block three success is that having that slightly green aspect plus the tropicals is just um, it's giving everybody an amazing experience um, of what Marble Sauvignon can look like. So all of your block um, three wine, yes. all of the bottles yes. of it comes from that one plot? That's right, this, this so that's is... Not this much, is the, that's not much wine is it? <laughs> no, it's it's not. This is uh, the the block itself. Um, don't don't know where you can read it. It's about seven hectares, just over seven hectares. But this area is super super fertile. It yields really well. Um, we're sort of we're we off this particular block. We're getting uh, a, a, about one hundred and fifty tons worth of fruit. Um, what does that translate as into bottles? Um, it's about seventy five thousand liters but not all of that goes to Pioneer Block. Okay. Um, at this stage, we're producing about 4,000 cases off this one. And that's really, um, if, the demand, if the demand was higher, we've got the ability to produce more, um, but we don't, don't want to have lots of wine sitting around in bottle and sold. Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc is generally regarded as, as a variety that um, drinks better in its youth, although there's a lot of people um, that are really enjoying a little bottle age on Sauvignon. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so why is this? We, we talked to Sam at Lismore um, last week, yep. and she said that all of her wines were wild ferments. Do you use wild, or do you use um, specific yeast to get? No, we flavors? we use specific yeast, Marlborough Sauvignon, um, or, the, or our particular style. Anyway, we're looking to express um, as purely as possible um, the the terroir of the fruit or the qualities of the fruit guys hey sorry <laughs> it's just howling away while they eating breakfast um and in order to do that we don't want any wild influences um wild ferments will often struggle when they get close to the end of their ferments and while that's great and in, in some varietals we've got no problem putting chardonnays um through through a wild fermentation um but for Sauvignon, we, we just don't want any influences other than what's coming off the vineyard. Um, we do do a very small amount of Brut fermented, which is um, some of that's put through wild fermentation. But um, wild ferments are great if they go well, but sometimes they don't go so well. And there's a yeah, lot at stake. There's a lot of value. And yeah, that's, that's, if, you've that's got, right. if you've got like supermarkets or whoever to, you know, satisfy, you can't, yeah. can't risk yeah. that, I guess. Yeah. And, because I find it fascinating like that, that you have these different plots and you have so many different wines that then you distribute, like, like you said, you've got grades um, of the wine, yep. so you've got different qualities. And yeah. then but within each quality, you've also got different wines that you give to different 
retailers or different markets, different countries. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. I mean, that gives you so much flexibility, does it not? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, close nice. questions. I'm just going yeah. Yeah. So, so with with the volume um, of different vineyards that we've got, uh, we've actually just finished our 2020 grading. Um, we'll go on to talk about vintage 2020 in, in, in a little bit of time, but um, we're we're grading about 120 different tanks of Sauvignon each year, and it's an amazing process. Um, and there's always highlights and always um, surprises. Um, this um, this particular area, Dylan's Point always on that blind grading assessment comes out top of the pops. Um, there's so very, very... Be... Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, what yeah. would you be looking for in terms of grading? And I guess this links to the tasting note. What are yeah. the characteristics that you're really looking for when you're grading? Okay, so we're, we, we're looking for um, concentration of flavour. Um, there's a group of compounds, uh, won't get too technical, there's a group of compounds called volatile thiols that some of you may have heard about. The Stillens Point area has the ability to produce a lot of those compounds. Um, they give us the tropical, they give us the black currant, the, the, this particular area um, builds in a, a little bit of salinity into, into the back um, palate, sort of oyster shell, almost a briny sort of character. Um, but overall, we're looking just for high expression. Um, some yeah. of our other sites up the valley give us the sort of greener, grassier, more herbal notes. Um, mm -hmm. But they lack the concentration that this particular area um, um, promotes into the fruit. And if you've uh, if you've tasted three by now, you should have. I hope. Um, I think you'll be able to experience just just that sort of wow factor that this particular area promotes. Yeah, yeah. it's it's definite explosion of tropical fruits. Like immediately, yeah. I've got pineapple, and then you know yeah. passion, passion fruit coming through as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, to understand a little bit of why this particular area, undiscovered for a long time, but why this particular area seems to be able to grow s um, such good fruit for us, I'll just zoom back out a little bit. We've got two major rivers or two run through through the province of Marlborough. We've got the Wairau River here and huge upper catchment. It comes all the way back up here. So all of these valleys, when it rains, um, drain down into this river. It's a braided river system. Um, when it floods, it's it's all it's got flood protection now, big stop banks to stop it spilling out over the valley. Um, but as you can see, braided river system. When this floods, it's quite erosive, um, and I don't know whether you can pick up, but you can actually see over the course of history. Um, these are parts of the old braided river course where the river has sort of swung across the valley here, and that's left lots of stones. Um, it's got an uneven, unevenness to it. Um, the Stillens Point area, by contrast, so this is the little river here that that um, drains. When this flooded, um, it was it was much less of an erosive style flooding. So this, the river would come out, flood into this area, and deposit nutrient rich um, silts. Um, again, now this this area has all been um, flood controlled. But we've got um, at least a couple of meters of very, very fertile flood silts um, over a sandy base, and it, it, it's evenness and the um, the fertility of the soil that has just really seen this area um, deliver the goods year after year after year. So just roughly, Saint Clair have vineyards. Not a hundred percent of this is is Saint Clair. Um, targeted fruit. There are a couple of other companies here, but St. Clair has, as a single company, um, probably got the biggest dominance in this particular area. Um, we covered that, this area. That, that yeah. small area there. And then when you zoom out, so you've got the, on the other side of, oh, I don't know what <laughs> the things are, but on, like nearer the, the Wara River. Yeah. St. Clair as well, or we've, we've got a few. Yeah, we've certainly got a few vineyards dotted over here. Um, we, over the course of time, have come to understand that um, the Sauvignon grown on these soils and sites, it doesn't have the, the concentration and doesn't certainly doesn't have the expression that this area here down here promotes. So um, we've got a number of growers, we've got a number of vineyards. 
in, in this area, but if we're looking to increase our production, this is really the only area we will consider um, to take extra Sauvignon Blanc fruit from. That's how good we think it is. Now, I know that Marlborough is a spiritual homeland for Sauvignon Blanc, very much thanks to, I think, Cloudy Bay there, but, um, who helped yeah. put it on the map. Where else in New Zealand can people look if they want to try other expressions of Sauvignon Blanc, aside from Marlborough? Yeah, okay, so down in Waipara, um, which, is, which is further down south, for, for those that aren't 100% familiar. So Waipara is down in this area. Oops, a little further south, down in this area. A little bit cooler. Um, yeah. They don't quite enjoy the same level of sunshine hours as, as Marlborough. Um, they're more at risk of some of the weather events. One of the great things that, that has made Marlborough so successful for growing, not, not just Sauvignon, but the other varieties as well, is, um, is just the geographic um, location. It's almost, um, imagine a baseball glove. Uh, the South Island here, you've got the Southern Alps, huge, um, tall range of mountains. Down below, uh, down below New Zealand, of course, is, is Antarctica. And so when we get big, cold, southerly blasts of, of um, nasty weather, it tends to roll up the country here. And then these sets of mountain ranges here kick all that bad weather out to sea. Wellington gets pounded. Um, with with cold cold windy weather, Marlborough here um, it, it sometimes referred to as hole in the clouds. And and if you've been to Marlborough, you might have experienced one of those days. Um, blue sky sunshine here, and yet it can be black, horrible, raining, windy weather over over in Wellington. Um, to our west, any 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 rain that's picked up from the prevailing northwest winds, and that's that's the, the predominant weather pattern we have through the growing season. Any water that's picked up has to climb up. The clouds have to climb up of up over these ranges before they get down into into Marlborough. And so, any rain bearing cloud um, drops its rain through here. Nelson also a very good place to grow grapes, but they do have a wetter growing climate um, and and a, and, a, and a bit more humid as well, which. Um, for disease reasons, um, is probably less favourable, but it's an incredible place to grow grapes here. Uh, very good climate through through the growing season. Gunn says he's visited some good vineyards in Nelson. So yeah. Yeah, Nelson, Nelson, Nelson can have stunner vintages, um, but but like I say, so they they're often um, they often experience a larger rainfall and and sort of a more humid growing season. But Nelson's a beautiful place and. Sort of visit Hawks, Nelson or, uh, where's Hawks Bay on that map? Because we've got the next wine is sure. Yeah. Okay, so again, just um, just giving people a bit of geographical um, um, orientation. So this one's called. This one's from a vineyard called the Plateau Block. Uh, it's a Gimlet Gravels vineyard. I'm just zooming out just a little bit. See, I had always associated Gimmick gravels with more Cabernet and kind of Bordeaux blends. Yeah, yeah, no, def definitely. So this this area here is 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 designated Gimlet gravels. Um, yeah. Very deep gravelly soil uh, laid down by a, a massive flood event back in the 1800s. If I zoom in again. It'll give you guys a bit of a bit of an understanding of what this particular vineyard, little vineyard here produces. Um, so we've got Cabernet, we've got a, a plant, uh, a plot designated for Reserve Merlot. Um, we've got Malbec here. We've got Syrah, of course. Um, and then this little corner here, we've got Pionier, which wow. is what you guys are tasting now. So this this area, we, we went to the Hawke's Bay because these particular varieties, we just cannot get them to the same level of ripeness. Um, we do have a little bit of Merlot in Marlborough, um, but it tends to be, it tends to have a slight sort of tomato stalky greenness to it in all but the very hottest years. Yeah. So we track, we track all this fruit down, um, with the exception of the Viognier, that we have a friendly winery, they de-juice for us and then send us the juice. So it, we're, we're, we're control freaks. So everything, everything that we bring out of the Hawke's Bay gets fermented down at the winery in Marlborough. 
I mean, it's fantastic because Sauvignon Blanc did really put New Zealand on the map, but then does it make it hard to sell other white varieties because the world's just so used to linking New Zealand with Sauvignon Blanc? Yeah, yeah, certainly Sauvignon Blanc's been the, the door opener. Um, most companies, not all, but um, a lot of companies outside of Marlborough um, do, do either source grapes or own vineyards. The, the power of having a Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc in, in your portfolio um, is, is really an integral part of, of most companies in New Zealand's success. Um, sounds, <laughs> yeah, it sounds, um, sounds a little odd. Um, a lot of, it's just, it's the base of the pyramid, I guess. It allows, certainly allows St. Clair to um, indulge ourselves in these other varieties. They cost more to produce, um, but Sauvignon Blanc's Kind of the bread and butter. It's it's what keeps the the money rolling through. Because I guess for the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, you know it's going to sell. And, That's right. Yeah. And yeah. with the others, with the other grape varieties, it must be quite like risky to go. Oh yeah, we're going to do we're going to do a Syrah. We're going to do a Pinot Noir. You yeah. don't know. I mean, Pinot Noir has got a name for itself, New Zealand. Yeah. Um, you know that's that's kind of taking care of itself but something like a new zealand syrup isn't really like one of the main ones that people would go for so it must be a little bit risky to go oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do those wines no you've you've hit the nail on the head and um the success of sauvignon has allowed us to set up a very high-tech pinot cellar had we not had had the the had we not had sauvignon blanc um I doubt we would have been able to be as successful as we have with our Pinot program. Um, it's, it's really what's indulged all of the capital inputs, the infrastructure to, to make Pinots as good as what we're now making them. Pinots, um, it's, it's, it, it's taken us a while in Marlborough um, to get it right, but I think that we now have, and certainly um, the success of Pinot is, is definitely on the increase. Um, Marlborough Pinot is second in, for us anyway, is second in tier. It's opening doors by itself now. People are seeking out um, Marlborough Pinot and then, then they're saying, oh, by the way, we'll take some of your Sauvignon Blanc as well. You go back 10 years and that was, nobody wanted Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc. Ah, sorry, Marlborough Pinot Noir. So, no, we, what's, we what's highly value that. What's proportion of, of what you're making and then what comes over to the UK in terms of so yeah. it's like your Sauvignon Blanc, ninety percent of what you sell, and then you've got the other little bit. Yes, yeah, so Sauvignon, of course, very successful part of, of our portfolio accounts for about seventy percent of our production. <laughs> Pinot is now at about ten percent. That's how that's how um, much in demand for our Pinot it is, and we're continuing to develop uh, more vineyard area. Um, taking Sauvignon Blanc out of sites that we now know are better suited for growing Pinot. That's the clay-based soils. Oh, that must um, be a big decision. Yes, yes and no. Um, Sauvignon will grow anywhere pretty much. But um, yeah, with the demand for Pinot coming up, um, we are looking at some of our sites and saying, okay, this is much better suited for, for Pinot. So let's take out the Sauvignon. Um, on a grading sort of point, it comes, the, the quality is coming off these clay-based soils. Uh, just aren't scoring as well, so we can afford to to sort of drop some of those out, which increases or improves the overall quality of all of our blends. Mm. And how would a Corks Bay Pinot compare to a Marlborough Pinot? Uh, with the Pinots, um, they they like a cooler. That they, they are more delicate. They like a cooler growing climate. Um, not a lot of Pinot grown in the Hawks Bay. It's just that little bit warm. They tend to sort of bake out yeah. those delicate aromatics that Pinot has. Um, but obviously very suited to grow those Bordeaux styles and, and some of those some of those varieties like Malbec that, that do need that extra sunshine and extra warmth. Yeah. But the, the little Viognier, it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a sneaky little one. And when, when we first bought this vineyard here up in, up in the Hawke's Bay, um, we didn't actually think, think the Viognier was going to have any future. In fact, Neil was talking about pulling it out, planting more, Mal, uh, planting more Merlot or um, perhaps more Syrah. Um, for a number of years, it really didn't enjoy great success in terms of sales. Uh, and then all of a sudden, um, it was you guys in the UK actually that, that picked it up. Um, thank you, UK. And that has really <laughs> taken, the Bion 
taken the Viognier off the chopping block, um, and it's great to see. We we really enjoyed we really enjoyed the um, the expression that the Viognier from there has. Uh, not as uh, obviously Australia, especially Yulumba, um, they have mm. a big. Um, they're, they're the specialists in Viognier, yeah. um, but but it tends to be more alcoholic. Um, tends to be a lot riper in spectrum, um, whereas the Hawke's Bay, the whole of New Zealand is is really a maritime growing area or growing climate, and so we are able to retain just a bit more, um, a little bit more elegance, for lack of better words. Um, certainly a bit more purity of fruit. Yeah. So, is there an argument to be made that as like Sauvignon Blanc is very easy to produce and it's out there and, and people will kind of buy it, that actually if people do buy New Zealand Chardonnay or Viognier or a varietal which is not Sauvignon Blanc, probably the quality is going to be better at that price point than most examples of that varietal from other countries? Yeah. Yeah, I think you, you, you did right. I think the success of, of the Marlborough Sauvignon has given consumers the confidence to l chase down producers they really enjoy and has given them the confidence to buy a Chardonnay or, or buy a Viognier. They, they may have never tried a Viognier from New Zealand, but if they know the producer and they've got confidence in that producer, then people, are, I think, are, are willing to take a punt and, and have a go at them. And hopefully nine times out of 10, um, they, they're rewarded and, and they go back to buy more. We've got um, a few people already talking about um, the Syrah and, and, and then also um, we're seeing some um, New Zealand Albarino. Have you got any plans for Albarino? Yes. Albarino, uh, we would love to make it. Um, I'll, quickly run through, uh, I'll quickly run through our, our varietal um, mix that we've got here at St. Clair. So Sauvignon, about 70%. Um, then we have Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Riesling, Gewürztraminer, Gewürz Tremina, Viognier, Pinot Blanc, um, um, and Apple is already quite full. Um, I would love to be growing some Albarino. Um, it, it, is an, it is to a degree an alternative white variety, and we're just um, not gun shy exactly, but just don't want to clutter up our portfolio too, too much more. Um, just not 100% sure what the demand will be like. Um, Grunewald Lina. We love to make, but it's not quite enjoying the success we, we kind of hoped it would. And um, unfortunately, we're sort of looking at some of our plots and thinking, okay, if we don't see an increase in sales here, perhaps we might have to reduce our, our vineyard areas of Grinner. Um, so, so we're just a little gun shy to go planting lots and lots and lots of different varieties. Yeah. Pinot Blanc is, Pinot Blanc is reasonably new to our portfolio, coming off an a old vineyard site. Um, and we'd like to see that built up a little bit more before we go dabbling with anything else. Um, you, you've been talking a lot about um, single varieties. Now, maybe not St. Yes. Clair, but New Zealand in general. Is there any kind of move to blends or is it just, let's keep it clean, let's keep it separate? There, there is a small demand for mixed varietal blends, white, white varietals especially. Um, yeah. But again, it's it's not seeing the same demand as a as a, as a clean single varietal. Um, we did produce one for the Swedish market actually, uh, a blend of of Gewürz, Pinot Gris and, and a little bit of Riesling. Um, yeah, and it was really yummy. Um, but it was just a, it's, it was only a one off. Um, it went to market and there was no repeat orders for that. And of course, as soon as you start blending varietals, it reduces your ability to do anything with them if the sales don't transpire. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, we're, where are we at with the tasting? Yeah, stuff? yeah. So we're we're kind of behind on the tasting um, and behind on the questions. But what you've been telling us about all the blocks, we've also got another question on the where's block six. I don't know if that's because someone has a block six. Wow. Block six. There's there's someone there's someone that's um that's been drinking Saint Clair for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Piney block six. Now this is this is a bit of a sad story, unfortunately. Oh, um, no. So Pioneer Block Six. We'll just quickly zoom back into into Marlborough. So we've talked about this great area called Dillon's Point and the reasons why it's why it's producing such good quality. So Block Six was um, what is was an incredible site for growing grapes as well, 
and this is this is the vineyard area in here just tiny tiny um, the growers the original growers that were doing block six decided that they would sell up take retirement um, the uh, the family that bought it um, weren't so into grapes and they pulled the whole vineyard out which is really sad because <laughs> it was an amazing expression um, but for similar reasons there's a little creek that runs through here and very um, nutrient rich silts in this area um, but block six is no longer unfortunately wow. um, so we're sad about that okay yeah um, so with the tasting, so I just, I, I had a question, I was hoping someone else yes. would ask it, but I have a question. In terms of the style, because New Zealand yes. I think of as being quite cool, um, yeah. is it more of that um, cooler climate style or because of the sunshine hours, does it actually develop into something, another style? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, again, the big success of, of Sauvignon coming out of Marlborough is, is the um, diurnal temperature range that we have here. Beautiful sunshine hours for uh, ripening, but at night time, Cloudy Bay acts like a heat sink, and so it drains all of the temperature out, so we can have a 30 degree day for ripening. Beautiful sunshine on the canopy for devel developing sugars and flavor. Nighttime, things cool down, and it's almost like putting your fruit in the fridge. Um, countries like Australia that have huge, uh, that has a huge land mass inland, even though companies could be growing grapes quite close to the coast, um, they just don't cool down to the same degree. They might have 30 degrees for ripening. Nighttime, they only get as low as 22 degrees, 21 degrees. Beautiful for living over there. It's great for, for great, greater for your person, but um, not seeing those temperatures drop means the acids continue to fall out faster. So this cool maritime climate that we have here in New Zealand um, sees good acid retention. Uh, it doesn't fall out during the night time. And when you've got good acid, ret acid retention, you're, you're locking the flavors as well. It means that we don't have to add acid like a lot of, um, a lot of companies in those hotter growing climate areas are doing. So varietal, uh, grape varietals um, that like that cooler climate um, are, are really successful here in Marlborough. And I just mentioned before the range of different varietals that we have here, the Pinot Gris, the Gewurz, all of those ones. Um, that's that's um, a big reason or big part of, of how we can get so much flavour packed into, into these wines. Amazing. And then, yeah. that, like, we all know that Pinot Noir is an absolutely picky, finicky grape <laughs> to grow. Um, how, how is the kind of climate there? helping with the Pinot Noir? Yeah. Um, so over the course of time and, and by keeping all those parcels separate, um, we have, and, and generally the feeling in Marlborough is that these finger valleys here called valleys, um, they have uh, quite deep clays through the, through the basins here. Uh, there is Sauvignon Blanc planted up in these areas but we now regard this as the best area for growing Pinot in Marlborough. So those, um, those, those clay-based soils um, don't carry as much fertility. And, and with that, and, and the clay itself locks up to a degree and drip feeds the vines with, with any nutrient that it does have. But it just reduces the vigor, keeps those berry sizes small, keeps the bunch sizes small. Um, we have to do very little yield manipulation. Um, we did have a trial block of Pinot down in the Dillons Point area, and it was just a total failure. Um, that's now been pulled out, um, top grafted. Um, um, it was just too vigorous. The bunches were huge. The berry size was huge. Um, the kind of waters quality, it, down it was, yeah, it was producing watery sort of strawberries and sour cherry and, and just everything that Pinot shouldn't really be. Um, so just too vigorous down in that Dillons Point area. Um, so Pinot for us is uh, these clay-based soils, a little bit from the Awateri Valley as well. Um, uh, talking about sort of other areas very quickly, you've got the likes of Central Otago. We don't actually source any fruit down there. Um, we would like to, but it's just uh, the fruit, fruit cost is just too expensive um, from down Central to get it trucked up to Marlborough is an expensive exercise as well. Um, but, but the same reasons, Central Otago, um, very cold in the winter much more of a continental ground climate down there, very hot in summer. Um, schisty, low nutrient soils, which again, um, 
promote small berries, small bunches, um, low vigor, and these are all the things that, that make Pinot good. It's interesting though, because being based in LA and just understanding a bit here, Americans yeah. find Pinot Noir from Marlborough much more easy to understand, much more accessible. Central yeah. Otago is a bit of a hard sell still, I would say. Yeah. That's right. People in LA, anyway, New York would be different, Chicago different, but. Yeah. I think, um, it, it, again, it's, it's it, Pinot is a finicky variety to, to grow. Um, the, the, the amazing thing with Marlborough is while we do have vintage variation, um, vintage to vintage tends to be very consistent. We don't see the big swings of good vintage, tough vintage, good vintage, tough vintage. And, and places like Central um, do experience some more challenging growing conditions um, in some years than what we do. And, and I guess as a consumer, um, Central Otago's come with a price tag. And when it's good, you don't mind paying um, ultra premium. Yeah. Um, but in those, t in those tougher vintages, um, it, it, it sometimes might promote a, a slightly more disappointing experience. People, um, people are finding Marlborough Pinots more accessible in terms of price point. Um, and, and I think we're starting to get it right. Um, we're understanding the vineyards. We're getting uh, more tannin maturity um, as those vines get older. Um, <laughs> Uh, kids racing around down there. Um, we're getting um, it just uh, we're just getting a more mature. The the fruit spectrum is is um, is pushing more into the into the dark um, forest berries. Um, we're understanding the incorporation of whole bunch um, much better. Whole bunch is something that that promotes um, freshness in a wine. It certainly gives it a bit more um, ability to to bottle age get it wrong and you can end up with a stalky, weedy tasting, tasting wine. And, and we've learnt by experience and, and had to blend away some of our experimental whole bunch tanks. Um, but slowly but surely through all of these, um, through all of these batch separations where we're getting it right, I hope, I hope. I certainly you feel our Pinot programs a lot better. You talked about how Central Otago Pinots um, suffer from vintage variation. Now something that, you know, as a consumer, I actually get quite frustrated by vintage variation. Yeah. But your other wines, so for the Sauvignon Blanc, for the Viognier that we've got today, and for the, yeah. like the Origins, Pinot Noir, Viognier, are they, are they quite stable vintage variation or do they also fluctuate? Um, there, is, there is vintage variation for sure. And every season throws, throws a different challenge. Um, but we don't, we don't see the extremes. Um, we don't we don't see um, significant hail damage, for example. Occasionally we get a little bit of, little bit of hail, but things, things like those extreme climatic variables, um, we, we just don't experience that here in Marlborough. And, and that, how, builds, that builds in that consistency. And how is um, climate change, change like impacting your business? Yeah, we, we are certainly seeing um, uh, warmer winters, although um, we just had a doozy frost this morning. Um, um, yeah, certainly the, the winters don't seem to be as, as, as hard as what they were when I was a kid. Um, we have a ski field not too far from us and, and they're experiencing tougher um, ski seasons. The snow's just not around as long. Um, we're getting slightly wetter vintages, although this one uh, just been and the year before, 2019 very dry. Marlborough um, often experiences drought conditions. We were very, very close this year to having some of our irrigation schemes shut down. Um, 2019 was a period where, where um, we weren't able to irrigate. Um, we had to cut water from the winery to just keep some of our young vines alive, going hand watering. Uh, so we, we're, we are seeing, seeing sort of more extremes, um, warmer winters, certainly hotter summers. This year, I've never experienced it before. We had a recording on one of our vineyards, um, 38 degrees. Now I've never experienced a 38 degree in my lifetime here in Marlborough. Um, so yeah, we're, we're certainly seeing that a big swing, big swing. And it's, swing. It's, it must be impacting like your farming practices, like the water, but also just, you know, if there's, if there's more, 
moisture in the air, if there's more rain, then you've got to think about, you know, other diseases and, you know, viruses and pests. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're certainly becoming more aware of needing to make sure that our investments are safe and secure. So um, we're looking at ways to store water for emergency irrigation purposes. Um, and to give you an example, we have a, a 200,000 litre um, emergency water storage on a, and I talked about a little bit before how we are pulling some of our bit, Sauvignon vineyards out and replanting. So these, the, these guys are getting replanted in Topino and a little bit of Chardonnay. But young vines, shallow rooted, um, if it gets too hot and dry, those vines will keel over pretty quick. The roots aren't down deep enough to, to maintain stability. So we're having to invest in, in making sure that these young vines are, are, are tended for, cared for. And of course, that comes at a cost. A big, oh, sorry, I was gonna say sustainability, that's kind of also what New Zealand's known for, right? Just generally, I'm not saying yeah. biodynamics and, and that everyone commits to organic viticulture, but that is, yeah. that is something which in general, the New Zealand wine industry takes very seriously. Right. Yeah, cor correct. Yeah. No, sustainability has it, it been a huge part of, of consumer confidence, I think. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, people absolutely. want to know. They, 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 we're finding more and more that, that people are looking for, for their provenance. They want to know where the wines are coming from. They want to know who's behind it. Is it, it does this particular winery have a dog that wags its tail or is it just a, a big brand that, that has just come from nowhere type thing? So people are seeking that out. Um, people are seeking out organic wines, um, but, but sustainability is, is playing a huge part in consumer comp. If they know the wine they're drinking has is, is come from a vineyard that's running sustainable practices, that are, that are running a, a good tight regime, um, they're being very, very careful about um, residues, and this is something our sustainable wine growing is very hot on. Um, we have a very strict um, program about what we can spray and when we can spray it to ensure there's no residues left in the wine um, and do you find you can control that quite well because if you're you've got a lot in that same area yeah that you can control what's happening because you don't get like spray from another field or yeah sure yeah um a, a little bit straight spray drift is always always um a bit of a contentious one especially if you've got uh, a vineyard that's trying to run an organic practice mm -hmm. Um, those guys are always on the radar looking to see what their neighbours are doing and, and if you're running a conventional program, um, you'll quickly get a phone call if, if um, you're spraying too much of a windy day. But the sustainable program run, runs across the board. Um, it, it goes from the vineyards and vineyard practices to the winery and making sure that the winery is running sustainable practices. Um, uh, we've got um, in, in order to have the winery accredited, we've got to provide evidence of our recycling programs, our um, cost on um, energy, um, so, so electricity, are we using LPG, if so, how much? Um, so we're, we're tracking everything, basically. Um, so there's also the carbon zero, um, and people are sort of looking at, at ways that they can um, reduce their carbon footprint. A little bit tricky because of course New Zealand's at the bottom of the world so in order to get our, our wine to market um, inevitably there is a cost on, on that carbon footprint um, everything has to get packed into containers and then shipped to the other side of the world so so do you do you estate bottle or do you ship in bulk um, we've got a bit of a mixture to be honest um, and and bulk is something that has been around for a very long time um, people think bulk is a, a a bad nasty word. A dirty word. Yeah. No, it's not. Um, bad bottle, is it? Yeah, bulk wine. Um, no, no. While we don't estate bottle, we don't have a, a bottling line on our particular site. Uh, when we built Saint Clair Winery, um, when we broke the joint venture up um, and built our own winery in two thousand six, um, we had at that stage we had the ability. Well, we had the economies of scale to to justify building our own winery. But we enjoyed a relationship in the joint venture where we had a contract bottling company that was right beside us. Um, they were looking to expand. We were looking to build our own winery. And so it was basically a conversation had around the coffee table. If we commit to this site, which is where the St. Clair Winery is now, and the bottling company you guys commit to the site beside us, we will continue to pipe through Hardline um, our wines to your bottling company. And that's been an incredibly successful relationship. Um, it's great in terms of quality. We're not having to put wine into a tanker. 
to shift it. Um, every time you shift a wire, you're picking up a little bit of dissolved oxygen, which is 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 not good in the sense that if, if it's not tended to with a bit of um, preservative, a little bit of sulfur, um, will cause premature aging, o oxidation. Gus. <laughs> um, and so uh, by doing that, by, by minimizing the amount of movements that we have to do with our wines means that we can keep our um, sulfur that we're needing to add to the bottle. We're keeping that to a bare minimum but still giving our wines the, the, the protection that, the, that they need. I just had um, a, a question crop up in the chat box about um, any plans for canned or bag and box. Now, Laura's very helpfully replied saying that you do bag and box for sweet market. Is there any of that plan? Are you keeping the eye, an eye on the UK market? I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of canned wines. So, you know, yeah. is there anything that... Yes, yeah, so alternative packaging is is definitely something that we're we're tracking carefully. Um, a bag and box has, has the connotation of the lowest grade stuff that you can can't get rid of. But the Swedish market has very very successfully proven that we can bottle good quality wine um, in in a in a well packaged box. The tech, the the bladder technology the the the, bladder, the bladders that the wine have been put into is much more advanced than, than what it was 10, 15 years ago. And so the wine has been given better longevity in, in a plastic bladder inside a cardboard box than what it was a while back. We certainly wouldn't indulge putting, um, putting varietals that do have good shelf life. Um, so we wouldn't consider putting um, Merlots or Pinots or because those uh, bag and box ones um, just don't or won't give the wines the ability to age that well. Sauvignon Blanc, however, which is considered um, a variety that's, that's better drunk earlier rather than later, um, I have no doubt that it will be highly successful. Um, I often wish and, and, and have sort of said occasion that maybe we should give it a go in our own domestic market, even if it's just like a Christmas special. I would, yeah. ha I would yeah. happily take a bag and box of St. Clair wine out on holiday um, um, rather than lugging, lugging around a six pack, um, take, a, take a bag and box. Yeah, and also the embarrassment in the morning with all the clinking and the recycling. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I just, I, I've got a question about the labels. So we talked about yes. the Pioneer Block and how the number three represents block three and that's, you know, we've gone through all of those. And then you also talked about the grading and the quality and everything yep. else. How does Origins, because these, these two are Origins, how yep. does that fit in your system? And then a second part B question to that is we talked about the different labels that you have and the different wines yep. that you make. How many different labels do you have for different retailers and different wines? Yep. Yeah, so so quickly running through the the tier system at St Clair, we have our reserve wines that sit at the top, and um, I think some of you have already tasted or or spoken about the Wairau Reserve. So that comes out of the very very uh, that that is the very best of our Sauvignon production. Um, it's what we consider the best expression, capturing everything that 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 vintage promoted. We then look at what's left on the table. Um, the candidates, basically the the wines that have scored ninety five plus in our grading system. Um, so those other top scoring wines, um, we look for single vineyard expression and they become pioneer block wines if we deem them good enough. We're, we're looking for points of difference. Um, so if we have two vineyards that are, that are tasting very, very good, but too similar, um, we'll choose which one we consider is, is got the edge and unfortunately the other one gets demoted. So the origin series fits under our pioneer block range. Um, so the origin series, this is, this is where, where it's such good value for money because it's basically taking any wines that didn't quite make the pioneer block, um, tier. It's taking, taking care of all of those, um, plus sort of wines that are in the 90 to 95 point scale. So sitting below the origin series is the biggest choice range. And that's more of a, a, a grocery targeted tier. Um, it's at a lower price point. Um, 
it's one that we don't mind. Well, we always mind if it gets if, if the price gets bumped too much, but we're very protective, especially of the Pioneer Block series. We don't want to see that discounted. Um, we don't really like seeing it in in um, general grocery channels. Um, good retailers, good good high street retailers, absolutely no problem. Um, and the Pioneer Black Pioneer Block range also very successful in the in the um, on premise arena as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Go on. Yeah. So the Saint Clair Saint Clair um, range accounts for a, roughly about fifty percent of our total production. So the other fifty percent, um, not necessarily sub quality, um, but we just we've we've got more volume than we can sell through the Saint Clair branded wines at this stage. But it, do, it does allow us to um, increase production as, as that demand keeps growing. So the sub-tier wines, we deal with a number of different supermarkets. We're supplying, for example, Marks & Spencer, a known label, um, made at St. Clair. Um, their winemaker comes out. It used to be Geneve Williams, um, but I understand she's left. But, um, so she comes out, or, or the winemakers come out. We give them a range of different tanks to, to choose from, and they make their own bespoke St. Clair produced, but under a Marks & Spencer label. Um, but it still says St. Clair we, on it. Uh, yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Mentioned in the background. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. there's, yeah, because you, you kind of, there's lots of tricks of how to make sure that your wine still sells, even if it's not at your. You that's, know. that's correct. Um, a, a lot of these, a, a lot of these um, ones, they would like to be able to leverage off the reputation of St. Clair, but we're protective of St. Clair. So we don't, we don't like to see gross promotion of this being a St. Clair wine, but it also protects um, those that are sporting the St. Clair brands. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I've got um, two more kind of off-piste questions. Yeah. Um, one is, have you doubled or thinking of doubled in late harvest, so the number? We have actually, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we've been producing a late harvest or a, a, a botrytized Riesling for a long, long time. Um, but a couple of years ago, we had a, a, a young vine planting um, that was developing, or it had too much botrytis to actually bother picking for table wine production. But I went back and checked on it at the very end of harvest. We were just going to drop the fruit to the ground. Again, just the young vine, um, young vine production. So there wasn't a huge volume of fruit on it. But went back and it had set up this most amazing um, noble rot and we thought, let's have a crack, let's have a go. We've, we've not done a, a Sauvignon um, Noble before. And this time, a couple of years ago, we produced a Noble Sauvignon Blanc. Um, small production. Um, it's still just trickling along, along in the background um, in terms of sales. Um, Neil hasn't asked us to, to produce another one yet, but um, we're hoping he might. So we might get um, some over here. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Right. Um, and then we've had a question about, um, let me just double check. Uh, it was probably bouncing off something we we're talking of earlier. So the question is, how about Martin Burpino Gris? Um, yes. Not quite sure what the direction of the question is. Um, have you I guess done that? Would we consider producing from there or I'm not, I'm not too sure either. Um, Martin Ma 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 is a Martin Brabino yeah. agree coming over to the UK now, people growing yeah. more grapes. Maybe it was when we were talking about that. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, Martinborough is a great place for, for grape growing as well. They do incredible pinots out of there as well as, as, as some of those aromatics. Um, the cost to produce a Pinot Gris when we can already produce a good Pinot Gris in Marlborough um, just sees us shy away from, from trying to source fruit. For a similar reason, that's where we, we are not really too keen on, on bothering about Central Otago. We're pretty happy with our Pinot grown in Marlborough and don't really see the need to, to look to regions outside of Marlborough to be growing it. Um, we looked briefly before at that Gimlet Gravels area up in Hawke's Bay. Merlot, Cabernet, Syrah, we can't produce in Marlborough to, to the same quality level, which is why we've, we've stepped, out, stepped out, out, out of the Marlborough boundary. And how how has um, the twin like you like you just finished harvest now, haven't you? How's yeah. that gone, and how it's, has lockdown impacted that? 
<laughs> it has been the most incredible growing season, um, I've got to say. And the grading, um, the grading process that we've just finished with the Sauvignon, we're still working through the sorting up the Vuara Reserve and Pioneer blocks. Um, I'll be doing a little bit more of that um, a little later this morning, actually. I've actually got the wines here. I just haven't bothered tasting them yet. It's just a little too early for me to taste wine. <laughs> so um, but the most incredible growing season, you know, we we didn't didn't have irrigation shut down, um, so we're still able to irrigate. But it was just day after day after day of beautiful ripening conditions. At one point in time, in in late January, February, we we're experiencing some, experiencing some very hot temperatures. I was a little concerned that we may have to be picking on um, acidities falling out. Um, but just as we came into sort of March, which is kind of the start of our vintage period, um, the nights did start to cool down and we managed to lock those in. So in terms of fruit quality, um, I think this is one of the best we've seen. Um, often you'll hear wine, wine makers bleating on about, oh, this is the best vintage ever. But um, I think in, in my opinion, this is probably the best vintage I've experienced here in Marlborough in, in 20 odd years. Um, all the battles came in, um, in incredible condition, absolutely disease free. Um, the yields were, were um, managed well. We didn't have a great flowering, um, but that actually worked in our favor. So we got, we got the volume that we needed, but it's certainly not gonna be a year where we're faced with oversupply, especially of Sauvignon Blanc, which, which can be a bit of a challenge. And then as, as the old shirt says, for those that might not have seen it, <laughs> this is our vintage shirt. This threw up a challenge that will make this vintage memorable, not just in terms of quality, but also the, the hardships we had to endure. Um, we were super privileged to be allowed to continue as an essential business. Um, the government said, okay, the wine industry among, among a select handful of other industries were, were allowed to carry on manufacturing or, or so forth. Um, but the processes and things that we had to put in place to um, to remain compliant um, was just something else. It really was. Um, the whole two meter social distancing meant that our day shift and night shift weren't allowed to interact. Um, we had uh, difficulties shifting uh, vintage staff from their accommodation to work. Um, there was no social interactions like we would normally do. Um, I really only got to know about four or five people over the vintage period outside of our permanent crew. And we have about 30 odd, 30, I think we had 36 interns this year. Some of them Kiwi, but the vast majority from overseas. And it's great. You get to, in a normal vintage, you'd get to meet these people. You'd get to interact. You'd get to know their story, um, get to know them. And this year we've, we've just totally missed out on all of that. Um, we're still in a lockdown situation. Um, we're at level two now, which means that we can um, we can work a little easier. We're at, we're at one meter social distancing now, but um, there's still a lot of things in place that just mean that that the whole wine making has just not been as enjoyable. The fruit quality has been great. Um, the weather's been great, but but COVID has um, certainly chucked up challenges that I don't really want to be enjoying or seeing again. Um, I was talking to Laura last week on a, just a little, uh, one of the wine tasting groups. And um, I'm starting to recover now, but what are we now? Just about the start of June. Um, we finished our harvest mid April and it's taken, basically taken that long to recover. Um, we've got vintage staff that are only just starting to now be able to travel. Um, they've come here to enjoy this great country with a backpack, uh, with a um, back pocket full of money that they've earned over the vintage period. So up until a few weeks ago, they weren't even allowed to travel outside of the province. Um, so it's, those sorts of things have been slightly relaxed. Um, yeah, we've been working hard to look after our vintage intern staff. So trying to give them work out. If there's not enough work at the winery, we've been trying to find them jobs out in the vineyards just to keep them with um, a bit of money in their pocket so they can pay their rent, they can buy some food. Um, they haven't been able to want to go, well, they haven't wanted to go home or haven't been able to go home back to their home countries. Um, we've got a girl from India that has just had her flights canceled once again. Um, so she's still here. She's out with me working in the vineyards, um, just trying to, trying to keep herself going. So yeah, 
it's 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 been it's been the weirdest vintage in in that sense. Yeah. yeah, and do you do you think you'll keep in touch with those interns even even though you've not met them and not heard their story? I I really hope I'm starting to get to know a few more of them now, but that's simply because um, they are. I've got a little vineyard team of people that have been displaced from the winery that I've been able to find them jobs out in the, out in the vineyards. Labor here is getting ex exceptionally expensive. Um, minimum wage has gone up. We're now looking at about $20 New Zealand as minimum wage. And then the contract labor gangs um, put their 30% on top of that. So an unskilled laborer to run through a contract gang is, is now charging, getting charged out at about $29 an hour. Um, and it's, it's just becoming a very expensive exercise. So we're still able to pay our interns um, a decent amount of money, but saving the company a little bit of money, keeping them employed, doing jobs that we would have otherwise had contract gangs doing. Um, pretty menial sort of stuff. Um, they're out there sort of looking for broken posts and counting um, dead vines and painting pruning and doing vineyard tidy up stuff but if you want um, to get into the wine industry. that's right you've, you've you've got to do those jobs that's all about it yeah i'm yeah. out there with them doing it so i was certainly not 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 bothered about getting hands dirty but that's you right. know i feel really i feel, feel really proud about st clair being a family-owned company we value value our, our teams and want to do everything we can to help support them especially in this tough year that we've had yeah. How many people normally work there? So on the production side, um, we've got a permanent staff of um, of twenty people, and that's a, that's the winemaking team, the laboratory guys, the guys out in the cellar, and then over on the administration side, we've got roughly twenty odd people over there as well. Um, uh, so so a reasonable sized team now. When I first started with St Clair, there was Neil and Judy, a couple of admin people that were working out of Neil's office back as home residents um, and that was it so we've we've and when I first started with with St Clair we were producing about 180 tons worth of fruit so a couple of thousand cases um, so St Clair I've seen St Clair grow from a little little boutique family owned company to a much larger but still run in a in a boutique style all these small parcels 300 odd tanks on site um, Lots of small presses. We're all geared up. It's all about small batch processing. Yeah. And, and I think that's to a large degree why St. Clair has been so successful. I think the other thing that we really enjoy is, is that, you know, because we look after our people, we had 16 out of the 36 people came on board this year. 16 of those were returnees and some of those had done vintages. We had one guy, Simon, who's a guy from UK. Hi, Simon, if you're there, I'm not too sure whether you joined in on this one or not. Simon is super loyal. In fact, he has just had his name put up on the plaque. He's, he's now done 10 vintages with us. He's a long-term returnee. But we, we like to foster a really good working environment for our staff. And we're hoping that, although we've had a challenge vintage this year with the whole COVID thing, we're hoping that we've, we're showing some of these guys a little bit of St. Clair love. And we're really hoping that we'll get a, a decent number of returnees back, especially hoping that um, we'll be able to provide a more fun vintage for them next year because this one was this one was tough yeah um i think that's all we have time for um we've just got two more final questions one yes. is um what's your annual production in bottles okay so so our total production not all of it is is going straight into glass um some we sh we ship off in bulk to be bottled um either in germany um or in or in the UK, um, and that's really just helping to minimise sh shipping costs, etc. Um, total production we're looking at about seven million litres worth, um, which is which is a fair old amount. It's, it's enough to drown in. <laughs> yeah, um, but like I say, all of those batches, all of those vineyard parcels are harvest, harvested and fermented separately, um, graded blinds so the conceived ideas about quality um, and once we've finished our grading process um, we'll then look at, at uh, market demand and what blends we have to create. Starting at the top the reserve wine, um, pioneer block series, single vineyard expression and then into the blended wines and that, that goes across all tiers so we've got pioneer blocks in reserve and pretty much all the varietals. 
And then uh, one final question. Uh, that uh, Noble Rot Sauvignon Blanc, yes. when will that be available in the UK, please? I'm not too sure. That's that's probably a question for Laura and our importers. <laughs> um, we, we, we have it available. Um, yeah. It would be a case of, of seeing if someone's someone's willing to, to put it on the shelf. <laughs> Can we all not just club together for it? Yeah, exactly. Oh, you probably could. Yeah, for sure. Why not? Yeah, talk again. Talk to Laura. Um, we're we, we're happy to happy cross the wine club stuff. Yeah. If anyone wants, um, email me and then I'll I'll talk to Laura. <laughs> talk to Laura. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. I mean, the one thing that I really love about Saint Clair is how it keeps that family feel, keeps that family ethos. You know, you talked a lot about your staff and how you're looking after them, and it's you know, yet you're so big. You're in you're in Waitrose, you're in Sainsbury's, you're in Marks and Spencer, you're in independent shops, you're in wine retailers, you're in you know mm. restaurants, you're in Sweden yeah. internationally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's se se like yeah, seventy markets we export to now, um, and and it's about it's it's about that pyramid, um, like the Wairo Reserve is the top of the pyramid would love to sell everything at that price point and everything at that quality but it's a little bit like cars and neil explains it's a little bit like cars um everybody would love to be driving a mercedes every day but the reality is you've got to jump in your little suzuki to get to work because it's more fuel efficient or and so you you always we've we've got that base stability i guess is what i'm trying to say um we've we're, we're in the great we've got grocery presence which which um um, keeps those volumes moving through. Um, we're in those independents. We're in um, on-premise. Um, some of the guys that are on-premise focused, some of the smaller wine companies here, um, it's really unfortunate that they are really feeling the pinch because, of course, all the restaurants around the globe basically have, have had to either um, rein in or close down in some cases. And so those small boutique producers that are on-premise only um, they are really feeling the pinch and I, I really my heart goes out to those guys because those guys have a huge amount of passion at what they do yeah 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 and I think everyone's been trying you know adapting trying hard to change yeah. what they're doing and yeah. I think I think the wine scene will change as a result in terms of yeah. you know where people put their products to market but yeah. thank you so much and we've had some yep. lovely thank you comments because you've been we've yeah Amazing. we've exhausted you I think. <laughs> yeah you're um, so welcome no no it's, it's always a pleasure yeah yeah really great to get it from you and you know this has been a again a very different webinar to other ones we've been doing which is fantastic to get different perspectives and talking yeah. about how the location impacts uh, the wine so much has been yeah. has been wonderful yeah. Um, and for everyone that's watching, uh, next week we are talking to Vanessa Kayran, who is um, the prestige director at Gerard Bertrand. So we're going to be talking um, about Pitfall, uh, Hampton Water, the John Bon Jovi Rosé, and uh, the Saint Chenian. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we're really looking forward to those. Um, yeah, celebrity celebrity rosés. Um, yeah. we'll, we'll be we'll be talking about that. And if anyone missed the um, Coravan ten percent discount code, it's all on my website as usual. Um, signing up to next ones all on the website. Um, yeah, just keep in touch and let us know if there's anything else you need. And yeah, thanks again, Amelia. Thanks again, Hamish. No, thank you. That was You're awesome. Welcome. Thank yeah. you so much. Yes, you're so welcome. Great yeah. questions, guys. Too very interactive chat. I like that this week. Yeah, lots, <laughs> lots more questions this week. Um, yeah, that was good. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Natalia. I got a few of yours through, so hopefully we've answered all of those. Yeah. All right. Thanks very much, and see you all soon. You're very welcome. Thank okay. You. Yeah, thank thanks, you. guys. Thanks, everyone, Bye. darling, and see ya. Oh, I.